Dragon Ball Badet. Dragon Ball Badet. Uh, Dragon Ball! Good old fighting old dragon in on forever Dragon Ball. Yeah, I grew up with it. Yeah, everyone knows what it is. And yeah, I'ma review it. For the one person in the world that is not aware, Dragon Ball is the multi-bajillion whatever dollar franchise that's done by Toei Animation and pretty much iconicized the fighting anime genre. Filled with battles and flanderization galore, it was one of the most successful animes ever created. And for most Americans, that is how they first found out about it. The anime. More specifically, the anime of Dragon Ball Z, which while it wasn't the first place that it was shown, was broadcasted across Toonami, to the delight of all the happy little excitement fantasizing children of the country. That, however, was not my introduction. Back when I was little, my parents had this neat Japanese comic called Dragon Ball. I'd look over the books with adoring fascination. The art the settings, the action, it was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. And compared to American comics of the time, oh boy did it generally look a fuck ton better than the alternative. I may not have been able to read any of the words, but I kind of didn't need to with how expressive and clear the scenarios and visual implications and humor were. And what I couldn't understand, I just delighted in the oddness of. What I did gather, though, was that it was a story about some boy named Goku who had a tail and went on adventures, looking for the objects that the series was named after, the Dragon Balls. Upon collecting all seven of the Dragon Balls, an enormous dragon would erupt out of them to grant whatever wish you desired. This, coupled with traveling through the exciting landscapes that the world seemed to be littered with and battling all sorts of crazy fighters, mercenaries, and demons, it... it was kind of impossible to look away from. I wasn't as limited to single pictures of action as I could have been, however, due to the fact that my parents also had tapes from Japan that they'd gotten a hold of. The tapes covered the material that was about three-quarters of the way through what we had of the manga, where Goku was fighting in the second tournament of the series, and eventually goes up against Ten Shinhan, who, at the time, was the latest antagonist. He may not have been the scariest, but I remember that him breaking Yamcha's leg after he'd already beaten him, it made it pretty easy to hope that Goku would beat him. Also, they had like the weirdest and coolest commercials I'd ever seen in my life on those old VHS tapes. But that, for the longest time, is what we had as material for the series. So when my parents heard that they were releasing English versions of it, they immediately got me and my brother the tapes that came out once it hit TV. And... nothing else happened. Like, literally, we only had that part of the first saga of the series in English. And... Other than the Curse of the Blood Rubies movie, 
there was nothing. I knew that the rest of the series had been made into an animated version since, you know, the tape thing. But as for us getting the rest of it in America, it didn't seem to be happening. I knew from the comic that they'd eventually go up against this creepy old man demon called Piccolo, and that for what I thought was the ending of the series, since that's all we had at the time, Goku would grow up for the final tournament and fight his son, Piccolo Jr., as an adult. But there didn't seem to be any way for me to access that material. And I... was fine. I was a little kid, what do you expect? I had tons of games and crap to play with to keep me preoccupied. I just found what I did have to be pretty cool on its own. But then, it happened. Yeah, they started showing stuff of this other series called Dragon Ball Z in America. Obviously, I could tell that it was all the characters I watched and looked at in the anime and manga of Dragon Ball, but they were... older. I thought that them growing up and finding Piccolo Jr. had to be the ending, since that's all my parents had up to. They never had the final book of the 23rd Budokai where he actually beats Piccolo, which leads into the next saga, they just had the start of that tournament. And it also just seemed fitting for them to be adults for that final conflict to me. So when this came out, obviously I sat down to watch it, cause, hey, Dragon Ball, there was actually more stuff to see in America. And it was stuff that I'd never seen before, gotta keep up with the story. So for Z, starts with an alien pod landing on Earth, and this guy that has longer spiky hair than Goku gets out, scans some things, heads off to find a guy called Kakarot, and shock and amaze, he's Goku's brother, and Kakarot's his real name, and blah blah blah, we all know this crap. Now, back then, for me, it was more of, what the fuck? He's an alien? Piccolo's an alien? W what's going on? But nowadays, obviously, that was most Americans' first exposure to the series. That was the start for them. So, it was just kinda... normal. To me, however, it was not. And it was only made even more bizarre by the weird-ass dubbing that they did. I remember whenever they would kill someone, they'd say they're sending them to the next dimension. Which I did not understand at all, because I didn't know that it was being censored, since that was probably my first real exposure to major anime censorship. And since I'd clearly seen what was death in the original series. So, in my youthful ignorance, I thought that the characters had gotten so strong that instead of killing the other people, their blasts were literally sending them to other dimensions by tearing holes in the fabric of space and time.
What? I didn't know any better. But while there was certainly some oddities to me with the revelations that were made, it did carry with it more possibilities. For instance, you got to see the actual afterlife, which had had only the briefest of elements displayed up to that point in the series. But, perhaps more noticeably, the sci-fi elements of the series had become more amplified. More specifically, Outer Space. And with Outer Space came Alien potential for diverse extraterrestrial life forms. Which probably meant very little, considering the vast diverseness of what we'd already seen throughout Earth's people. But regardless, outer space. Meaning they only go to one planet that's the most boring-ass location in the entire series and do nothing but fight and fight and fight and soul-crushing end-of-the-world drama and fight and fight and fight and... Yeah, okay. It's obvious that I'm in the minority, and I may legitimately get killed for saying this, but... I like fake Namek. I certainly liked it a fuck ton more than the actual Namek. Like, God, it's a whole other world, and all it is is one gigantic wasteland to do nothing but fight in. Yeah, there's some famine or whatever, but you can come up with any excuse for why it's in that state. End of the day, though, it's boring. The designs of the houses are nice nods to Piccolo Damio's throne, but other than that, there's nothing. Fake Namek had ruins, had diverse landscapes to hunt for Dragon Balls in, had actual adventure. It had the stuff that I watched Dragon Ball for. Yes, it's a series that has popular fights in it, but that was hardly all that it was. Throughout the sagas prior to the Saiyan Saga, you had quite a vast array of locations that you got to see on Earth. Primitive villages and high-tech sci-fi cities with floating cars and animal people, snowy fortresses and xenomorph-shaped robot-guarded pirate caves to compete against the Red Ribbon Army in, Islands with giant fruit, the king of the world's tower, the tournament. That stuff was just awesome. And the adventuring that was done through them was just... Oh, I can watch it all day. But the Saiyan Saga onwards, god damn, is it dull by comparison. I'd actually say that Piccolo Jr. is where it starts going downhill in that regard, but... I always just sort of saw that more as an epilogue chapter than an actual full-fledged saga. After that, however, it's just barren wasteland, barren wasteland, alien barren wasteland, barren wasteland, look out, barren wasteland, godly barren wasteland. And that's, that's to say nothing of Earth. After they get back home, Earth is practically nothing like what it had been previously. What used to be crazy environments and a mix of humans and animal people just become what are pretty much average, more realistic looking cities and practically only humans. But nothing compares to the boringness of Namek to me. It was, it was already dull as hell to look at, but in the anime, God damn, not only did it go on forever, but in America, before Toonami, they only got pretty much up to where Goku fights Jace and Burger, and then it'd go back to the start of Z every fucking time. I couldn't believe when they finally got beyond that after they'd started showing the newer dub on Toonami, but then it gets to Frieza, and why the hell is there a fight that is that long? I know it's the most popular and adored saga in the entire series, probably for Super Saiyan and only knowing about Saiyans for newcomers, thus connecting relevance to the villain of the saga, but I could not stand that crap, is what I'm saying.
ちが続々と登場君もこのおいしさにペロペロっと参加しようクリコニューペロティ50円ペロタンもねパキパキパキかわいいとサクサクっと軽いナッキーリトルはかわいいグリコリトルポキーナッキーとチョコエンリッチI swear, I had to sit through Namek and Frieza and all that garbage for literal years before it finally moved past that with the constant reruns they did. And I knew there was stuff past that by then, because by that point my dad had gotten copies of the Japanese tapes of the Cell games, and a couple of episodes of Boo, and some from a show called Dragon Ball GT as well as these walkie-talkies of Super Saiyan Goku and Final Form Frieza, which made me think that Final Form Frieza was the Japanese form of Frieza, and the first form was his American form, since that's all we ever got to see, because they kept doing the reruns. But while I was able to watch fractions of what came after, I had to go about my days while this shit just dragged on, and on, and on. Part of the reason I liked Fake Namek by comparison is because it felt like Dragon Ball. Most of the Z-era stuff did not to me. I came because it was fun. I did not watch it so that I could see just fighting and playing hide and seek on the most boring planet ever. And while Namek also has filler, which is what fake Namek was because by that point the team making the anime had caught up to Toriyama's current chapters in the manga, so they had to make up stuff so that Toriyama would stay ahead of them, the filler on Namek is generally the typical filler of Z, which is just showing people powering up constantly and giving reactions from everyone and their goddamn grandma on the fights. What little extra adventures there were added to Namek, I appreciated. But it could hardly save what I would eventually feel to be the worst part of the series. And then you got Frieza. Yeah, I'm absolutely gonna die for this review, but fuck this Dude. Color scheme is chalk white emptiness. He's a spoiled brat that waits until every troop he has is dead to fight. And then when it gets to his fight, that takes for fucking ever also. I know he's the most popular villain in the series. But he is just the epitome of the series' shallow spectacle to me. I would say he's the epitome of everything wrong with the series, but that award would have to go to a character that isn't even from the original comic. But it was finally over. After years and years, it was done. Namek was destroyed, I never had to see that godforsaken place ever again, and Bulma gets together with Vegeta. What? This may be like one of the most popular couples in anime, but watching when it came out in America, while having knowledge of the entire series, this was just the most weird-ass bizarre thing that had happened in the series. Now, everybody likes to joke about Yamcha. I was never really sure why, because things that happened to him in the series just seem to be typical Dragon Ball stuff, and him dying in the way that people make fun of him for on the internet was legitimately tragic and emotional. But regardless of what people post, up until that point, Yamcha and Bulma were pretty much the couple of the series. They were the ones that fell in love in the very first saga, that were always with each other, 
and that always seemed to endure whatever little tirade Bulma would bring up. Even when she'd go gaga over other guys, it was pretty clear where her heart was. She'd get jealous of other girls liking Yamcha, and unjustifiably get pissed at him. But deep down, she obviously loved him. That's... that's kind of the point of the relationship. Even after she makes the ludicrous claim of Yamcha cheating on her in the Saiyan Saga, she's still mortified over his death. That... that's part of the reason she goes to Namek to wish the guys back. People always bring up well, they weren't good for each other. It's realistic that they wouldn't stay together. He cheated on her, blah de blah 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 First off, realism. Realistic relationships in Dragon Ball. With how goofy and dramatic the series was, the romanticized star-crossed lovers fit pretty perfect throughout the material especially with how vapid the actual relationships other than them usually are. And as for the cheating on her, yeah. According to Toriyama, a lazy-ass comic maker that says whatever's on his mind at the time to justify whatever decision he's making at the time, he did cheat on her. But there is nothing in the story at all to imply that there was cheating going on. Nothing other than Bulma's word. The girl that was proposing to go find a better boyfriend when she heard that other girls liked her man, but that's with him still at the end of that saga. Her claim that he cheated on her sounds exactly like that previous jealousy-fueled overreaction that she gave previously. So all it ends up sounding like is Toriyama going, Yeah, he totally cheated, guys. Like, obviously he did, am I right? But realism for them not working out or any reason you can make up is clearly not why it happened. It was so that trunks could be made. That's literally the only reason that Vegeta and Bulma get together, because there is nothing to them. Until the end of the series, that is not a relationship. That is just randomly slapping two characters together so that a new character that's going to show up in the immediate next chapter can be made from them. Since Bulma is the only girl left to make a baby with that Toriyama hasn't forgotten about at the expense of any feeling or emotion being elicited from any relationship involving those characters. <sighs> yeah, yeah, you can probably tell that my outlook on the series as it goes on dampens quite a bit. It's nice not to have to look at Namek anymore after Frieza, finally. But, as I said previously, the Earth they come back to is quite a bit tame compared to the fun-filled landscapes of its previous outings. It's quite a bit interesting, though, as well as pretty shocking, that they make use of the remains of the Red Ribbon Army, the third saga in the series, to present the next threat. And when Cell shows up, he's basically a horror movie monster. It, it's legitimately terrifying and gave me nightmares when I was younger. But once he becomes perfect, it falls back into the standard boring fight addiction nonsense of Namek. Only they have a tournament ring to participate in. But at least you get Mr. Satan. I may not be able to stand the implication that every person on the damn planet does not remember the original tournament characters and what they could do. 
But dear lord, does he inject comedy back into the ever-waning hope that the series wouldn't just fall into all-out despair with how bleak everything is by that point. And I can at least take solace in the fact that the announcer is elated to see the actual fighters again in the next saga after putting up with Mr. Satan's crap for all the years it's been since the 23rd Budokai was held. Plus, Mr. Satan's friendship with Boo is genuinely nice to me. I may hate how stupid powerful everything is by that point, how much Saiyans have overtaken the series and absolutely destroyed what I thought to be the best character in the series in the process and all that crap, but no matter the saga, they all do have points of interest for me. Yes, even Namek. Best Vegeta there'll ever be. Even with how idiotic it is to have characters that are that powerful and expect me to care about anything by that point with how meaningless such constant power makes everything feel, it still ends up feeling legitimately tense by the end with a threat presented that, if it's not dealt with, would wipe out all of reality, the afterlife included. And it also helps that Kid Boo's fight is one hell of a fight to end the series with. Just pure evil-looking psychotic childlike maniac wielding the power to destroy gods. It's... it's pretty great to watch. And then you get to GT. And then you get to Super. Needless to say, I don't like them. GT just continues things on as a pretty subpar after series with quite some interesting setups, but rather wasted payoffs and some all around absurdity. And super well. I couldn't make it five episodes in before I gave up in boredom. And no, I know what the rest of Super is like, don't worry. I still don't like it. The main problem with any after stuff is that all the characters are just so strong by that point that it's... There's no tension to be had. I mean, the fight against Beerus and Super was threatening to destroy the entire universe from its shockwaves. It was just... How the hell am I supposed to be invested in something like that? There's certainly no room for actual adventuring anymore with how everyone can just basically teleport anywhere. So all that's left, pretty much, is unrelatable, explosive fights with little to no emotion to be felt from them, and jokes that hardly compare at all to the humor used prior in the series. Especially when they attempt to poke fun at things that are only elaborated on from stuff made popular on the internet. Obviously, the franchise has long since passed me by. There's those that like the new stuff, but I most certainly am not one of them. It's a series that ended decades ago, and that had an ending to it. If it was going to continue on at all, it should have just been a next generation type of thing, with the newer characters looking to the old ones as legends. Just entirely new stories that don't rely on the old cast. Their tales were told and done. They'd reached their conclusions, they got their finale. But I know that doesn't make as much money as slapping Saiyan faces on everything. So, whatever. For me, it ends at Boo. That's what the time frame of the original manga ended at. That's the series. To me. But Edward, you ask, as if I know what I'm talking about. What version of the series should I get? There's been five bajillion releases by now. Well, lucky for you, I can give a general overview of the different runs of the series. 
Originally, Dragon Ball was a manga that had a new chapter put out every week in the Japanese magazine for boys, Shonen Jump. Now, while proper copies of such old material is a bit hard to come by, especially for the entire series in good condition, it is the version that has everything that was originally in it. The large size, though garbage quality paper, all the colored pages, everything. After the chapters would appear in Shonen Jump, however, they would go on to be gathered in the first proper collection of the series, the Tanko Bonds. These were the books that my parents originally had on the shelf as I was growing up, and was how I first saw them. The paper quality is not the greatest, but it has a certain rough, authentic feel to it, and the cover for each volume is some of my favorite art of the series. Especially with the crazy vehicles that Toriyama likes to draw and how they work in the number of each volume into the picture in some way. Sadly, though, the pages that were in color are grayscaled for its more affordable price. Over here in America, I remember some of the issues that we were able to get were an actual standard comic book size, which was a lot larger than I was used to seeing for the series, though they had quite a bit of censorship from what I recall. An element that is present in pretty much every American release, no matter how minuscule the censorship is. Eventually, they'd go on to be collected in Tankobon-sized volumes here as well, though, annoyingly, they split it into two different series. One set for Dragon Ball and one for Z, which completely fucks up how the books look when you put the two sets side by side. You see, in the Japanese version of the manga, there is no Z. That is not a thing. Peel off. To Boo is simply Dragon Ball. That's it. The anime is what renamed itself in the Saiyan Saga as Z, likely to bring in more of an audience by promoting a new series. Toriyama didn't even know when Z started in the story when asked at one point, and simply suggested to use the last letter of the alphabet when the team asked what the new series should be called, since he thought he'd be ending it soon. But, probably because of popularity, they always try to market the later parts of the manga as a manga of Z in America. Which is just really stupid. All it does is screw up how the one series looks on the shelf by insisting on this divide in the story that simply does not exist. But, Cosmetics aside, they still keep one pretty cool feature of the manga, which is the spines of the books. When you line them all up, they make one long picture on your shelf, and that Tankobon one that they also use for the standard English volumes has always been one of the coolest images ever to me. Finally, in 2002, they started releasing the Kanzenban in Japan, which were volumes re-releasing Dragon Ball, with almost all the colored pages from the original Shonen Jump release now in color again. New artwork for the covers, and a larger size than the Tanko Bonds. I believe there's some cropping on some sides of panels at times, but it also allows you to see further down sometimes, I think, than even the original Shonen Jump release. Given how old and probably impossible many of the original Shonen Jump copies in good condition would be to find, the Kanzenban is one of the best ways to own the manga, especially considering how much better of paper the series is printed on in it. Even if you lose the Tankobon's intro cast pages and have the iffiness of the tacton changed ending Toriyama added to the cons and Bon version. It wasn't until 2008 that the translated versions would get a more comparable version. At pretty much the same size as the cons and Bonds, Viz released the Vizbig version of the manga, 
While it did add color back into some of the colored pages, there are still some left grayscaled. Probably the most appealing thing about it is simply the size, how many volumes the VizBig version collects in one book, and having some of the pages in color. That being said, it's a completely missed opportunity to not have all the colored pages that were in the Kanzen Bond done in color. The covers of the volumes, sadly, are just generic pictures of Goku, and the spines are pretty... meh, and don't line up to form a picture or anything. It's kind of neat that the final... Uh, Dragon Ball volume has one large image of Goku to signify the transition into the later stuff, but that's about it. Probably the best version you can get of the translated manga, but sadly does not compare to the Kanzenban. We did eventually get the Kanzenban covers, though. Well, some of them. This one actually pissed me off, because... Given that it's the Kanzenban covers, if you know what the Kanzenban is, you might go into the three-in-ones thinking, oh, finally, I get... what the fuck is this crap? The three-in-ones, while probably the most uncensored version of the translated manga, are pretty much garbage paper quality, all in grayscale, for the pages that should have been in color, and don't even have much of a benefit of size since the Vizbigs already collected the series around this many volumes per book. Pretty much the only benefit, other than maybe slightly less censorship, is that they finally don't separate the series by making the later ones a Z manga, but <laughs> like that even matters with this crap. Oh, there's also digital recolorings of it, which are nice and retain some color choices of the manga, like Bulma's purple hair, but I prefer the original physical colors Toriyama put down, just a good texture to them, and the limited color pages where things are black for darker areas at times gives it a nice comic booky vibe to it. The digital colored version is better than other digital recolorings I've seen, but I've got more of what I want already. The absolute most accurate to the original release version, though, came in 2016, the Soshuhen, or the Digest release, designed far bigger than any release after the original serialization, the Soshuhen is essentially entire Shonen Jump magazines, but instead of having various different comics throughout it, it's all Dragon Ball. All the time. Promotional slogans, previews, color pages, posters, and other trinkets included. And it's... pretty awesome. It may include the Change Kanzenban ending page, but... That is what I'd consider a small price to pay for what is essentially, otherwise, the perfect release of the manga. The only big downside is, well, it's replicating Shonen Jump. The colored pages are on glossy, never gonna get damaged pages, but the normal black and white or limited color pages? Yeah, this... this is more shit quality paper compared to other later releases, like, you can just rip this to pieces. But that is how it was originally published, so it's accurate, at least. <sighs> Too bad it's only in Japan. If you want the releases of the anime, however, well, the furthest back I can remember is the VHS tapes. We have, like, two different copies of the first one, which I found kind of odd, but who's gonna get a VHS these days? No, what you want is DVDs. No, not this shit! Well, okay, I guess for you die-hard American soundtrack fans, yeah, this or these Blu-rays are your go-to material. But, going by quality, the best way to own the series is... 
in Japan. Well, yeah, that is true. Sent out to a select group of fans that ordered it, Toei released the Dragon Boxes. These sets had the team go back and literally clean the footage up so it looks the absolute best that it's ever going to look. Has pretty much all the stuff that was included on the air when they first showed the series and is essentially the dream gem of any fan of the series. When it was brought to America though, they only did Z because for some reason they always start off with Z. Like in Japan, though, it was only a limited release for the American Dragon Boxes. Meaning that if you want any single box now, well... <laughs> buddy, you better have the cash, because... Holy shit. But you get the best quality you ever could for the footage. Yeah, some of the film they used was too old, resulting in some irks here and there color-wise. But compared to the alternative, it's obviously the best. But if you want things at an affordable price, all you really got is the blue slash orange slash green bricks for DVDs, which, in Z's release being the largest offender for some reason, ups the contrast way too much a lot of times and crops out parts of the footage by having a widescreen mode that simply chops off parts of the footage. For Blu-rays, there's the standard season sets, which I believe are cropped better than the orange bricks, and they've got this cool line the covers up to form a long picture gimmick to each of the three sections. I've heard the level sets might be better, but they never finish them, so yeah. Yeah, collecting Dragon Ball stuff in America in the best way has always been kind of impossible since they always seem to botch something about the releases up in some way. Though if you're not a big fan, you're not going to notice anything that I'm talking about, meaning that pretty much any release will be good enough for the general audience. They all mostly come with Japanese and English versions for each release, so yeah, take your pick. But then there's the whole issue of how fucking long Z is. And for that, in 2009, Toei started airing Dragon Ball Z Kai. And I'm gonna call it Dragon Ball Z Kai and not just Dragon Ball Kai because, for once, the English name actually fits better since it just covers the Z part of the series. Which I want to say it's due to the original series not having as much stuff to edit out is the reason they didn't make a Kai version of that one, but I know I'm just in denial. Basically what Kai amounts to is going back over Z, adding effects to certain scenes to liven it up, taking out the mountains of filler that plagued the original show to keep it more in line with the pacing of the manga, and redrawing certain scenes to make it look quote unquote better. And yeah, what was once nearly 300 episodes is now chopped down to a much more manageable 167 episodes, though at the expense of what I find to be some of the more enjoyable filler of the series that helped balance the more bland direction the series was taking. When it got to the end of Cell, though, it went on quite a bit of a hiatus, as there had been no plans to go beyond that point in Kai. But eventually, they finally got around to Boo, which feels kind of different with this green tint it was given, more filler left in, and just overall does not match the rest of Kai to me. Even Japan, though, is not safe from censorship as some of the bloodier scenes of the series are noticeably less bloody in Kai. And with a series that is as violent as it can get in the manga, I prefer to see it go in a more uncensored direction when edits are made, cause... Yeah, the, uh... <laughs> Cell Juniors, they, uh... do not turn into smoke in the comic. 
least it wasn't the Nicktoons version, though. I mean, balls of light instead of halos, people exploding into sparkles when they die, and, of course, Blue Popo. The thing was an absolute mess of confusing censorship decisions, and the internet will forever be thankful for the material they're given to work with from it. Oh, and Kai has like this really, really stupid prologue in the first episode that absolutely ruins the reveal of Goku's origin. That's revealed in the very first episode of the saga Kai starts on. So you get this. So it came to be that this child from a faraway planet fell to Earth. Oh dear, I can't very well leave you out here all on your own. <laughs> and thanks to the kindness of a stranger, he would make this new world his home. And then you get this. You're all grown up. Uh, but I could tell it was you at a glance, Kakarot. Kaka, what? My, how you look like our father. Huh? What does that mean? Not to mention it causes this weird pause the show to insert this meaningless explanation if you're watching Kai right after coming off of the original Dragon Ball show. But yeah, that be Dragon Ball, a 1984 comic by Akira Toriyama, a dude fresh off of the heels of his Dr. Slump manga and who now ducks into the offices in modern times to give thumbs up to whatever anyone working on the series now shows him. It's certainly got its ups and very very low downs at times, but it's a series that'll always be dear to my heart. I can only just pray that one day the overseas audience gets the release that the huge fans of the series long for. Can't complain much though, I mean, I've mostly got what's important to me from this series by this point. The entirety of the manga up to Piccolo Jr. showing up in the Kanzenban. And the only affordable way I can really see the original series, so... Yeah. You lot have fun with whatever recolored Super Saiyan transformation over muscled mindless garbage they keep putting out now. I'll just admire what I've always liked about it. What the... Wait, why are the cameras doing that? I didn't set them up. Ugh, oh. Huh? Uh, you guys heard the part where I like things from every part of the series, right? Mad Ha Mad Ha
Oh, right. There's that. If any of you want to support me on here and help me keep making the videos I do. And, uh, help me get this fixed back up.